I've been tasked with this breakout session with talking about uh, the Psalms and their relevance for the doctrine of general revelation. Dr. Uh, Brionis, he's dealing with Acts 17. Dr. Nichols dealt with Acts 14. Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Moeller dealing with Romans chapter 1. I've been given as my text to work with the entire book of Psalms, <laughs> which, which will ex explain why I'm not going to start by having you open your Bible and reading the text because <laughs> we won't finish. So what I'm going to be doing is offering some broad, systematic, theological perspectives on general revelation first, and then we'll come back and look at Psalms and some general teachings, general assumptions about Psalms, and look, then look specifically at Psalm 19. So we are going to touch on the Psalms, but I do need to hit some introductory principles first. If we're going to talk about the doctrine of general revelation, I find it helpful to define the terms first. So with the, with the word revelation, first thing to know is that we're not talking about the book of Revelation. We're not talking about how to identify the beast or the seven seals or anything like that. So if you're here for that, my apologies, that's not where we're going. We're, de we're dealing with God's act of revelation, his act of making himself known. And that's basically what the idea of revelation is. If you look at the first couple of verses of Hebrews, here you have a great text to introduce the concept of revelation where the author of Hebrews basically describes the way God has spoken in many times and in many ways he has spoken and has made himself known in these ways. So we have here in Hebrews 1 uh, reference to the contents of Revelation, the time, and the means of Revelation. The content of Revelation, he's revealing himself. God reveals himself, his existence, as we saw in the earlier discussions of Romans 1. He reveals his glory and the works of his hands. That's dealt with throughout Scripture, and we'll be looking at a few of those passages later. He reveals his wisdom and his power through his providence and through the works of his hands as well. And he reveals his will to his people. He reveals his law, for example. And ultimately, he reveals himself in the incarnation. Jesus Christ is the ultimate, the pinnacle of revelation. When Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And so it's, not, it's, it's his incarnation and in his teaching that he's revealed. Hebrews also says he revealed himself at many times. This, we could go back to Genesis 1 and just work our way from Genesis 1 all the way through and look at the way God has revealed himself to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, and so forth. Sometimes in visions, sometimes in dreams, sometimes in verbal communication. So many times and in many ways, as I was saying, in, in dr dreams and in visions and verbally, and through his created works. And so Reformed theology and Reformation Bible College stands in the tradition of Reformed theology and the confessional Reformed theology has tended to categorize the many ways, the diverse ways that God has revealed himself under these terms, general revelation and special revelation. We already noted that revelation means a way of God making himself known. So what then about general and special revelation? Well, our confessions themselves, whether you are in a Reformed tradition that uh, subscribes to the three forms of unity or the Westminster standards, both teach two means of revelation. If you look at the Belgic Confession, Article 2, for example, it describes these two ways of revelation as two books. It says in Article 2, we know him, that is God, by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many characters leading us to see clearly the invisible things of God, even his everlasting power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.20. All which things are sufficient to convince men and leave them without excuse. Second, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us, by his holy and divine word. That is to say, as far as is necessary for us to know in this life, is to his glory and our salvation. And then for those of you who are in the tra Westminster tradition, you know that the Westminster Confession of Faith, right off the bat in the very first paragraph, makes this distinction between general and special revelation. Saying, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet they are not sufficient 
to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners, echoing Hebrews 1 there, to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto the church. And he goes on to say that he commits the same holy unto writing, which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. Those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. So these two categories of revelation through creation and providence on the one hand and through his spoken word committed to writing, are what Reformed theology is termed general and special revelation. So general revelation, in a nutshell, is, occurs through creation and providence. Special revelation occurs through, ultimately, prophets, apostles, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and is committed, finally, into writing. So if we can keep that in mind, I think it, we can avoid some of the major confusion that's associated with discussions of general and special revelation. Keep in mind, it's one God revealing himself in two ways, through creation and through special revelation. I don't have a whiteboard or chalkboard here, so this is my whiteboard. You just have to imagine it. God, creation, and scripture here at this point. So God has revealed himself by two ways, but it's one God doing this. Um, general revelation in Reformed theology is something that's part and parcel of early Reformed confessional theology. We can see this again, it's in the Belgic Confession, it's in the Westminster Confession, this distinction that's being made. It's in the major Reformed theologians. And in this, it doesn't differ significantly from the theology of previous generations. Um, general and special revelation, even though they might have been termed something different, the concepts are there in the centuries leading up to the Reformation as well. This is another thing that we have to remember is that the Reformers, they were trying to correct the abuses of the existing church, but they weren't trying to start something new from scratch. Think of the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. That's taught in the early and medieval church. The reformers didn't say, well, we're correcting all the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church, so we're going to have to do away with the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ and all of that. They were correcting errors, but they maintained what was good. They didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, and part of the baby is general and special revelation. That's part of what they kept. Um, bathwater, we can find a lot of that, but that's not the topic <laughs> we're on today. However... Here's the thing to note, in recent centuries, the doctrine of general revelation has fallen on hard times in certain circles, and we need to think about the reasons why, given its pedigree, not only in the early and medieval church, but in the first generation and second generation of reformers and the theologians who put that into the theological textbooks of the 17th, 16th and 17th century. I think one of the reasons why general revelation has fallen on hard times in evangelical circles is because of the contemporary conflict between science and scripture or science and the church and a misunderstanding of what's going on in that conflict. Christians are constantly being told day after day that the findings of scientists contradict the teachings of scripture. And we're having to face that onslaught almost daily from the media and from scientists. We've all... I mean, most of you are probably aware of the Richard Dawkinses of the world and the four, you know, the, the new atheists, all of whom claim to be spokesmen for science. Well, when you hear this daily, decade after decade, that science contradicts scripture, and you start to think scientists, they study the created works, the natural world, therefore, there's something wrong with that. Studying the natural world is obviously dangerous because it's leading to all these accusations against scripture. We want to maintain the truthfulness of scripture, so let's stay away from nature. And that's not really in line with the early church, the medieval church, or the reformed church. So what's going on here? I think part of the problem, and I'm back to my whiteboard, my invisible whiteboard here, is that we're confusing God's act of revelation his twofold act of revelation with, well, we're confusing God, his means of revelation, and human interpretations of those means and of the content that's revealed through those means. God is infallible and inerrant. What he reveals, whether through creation, through providence, or through his holy scriptures, cannot contradict itself because God cannot contradict itself. So how do conflicts arise? Well, that's our fault. 
we are fallible and we interpret the nature of creation and the nature of scripture sometimes incorrectly and we interpret what's revealed through scripture and nature incorrectly at times. Just to give you an example, we could interpret creation as nothing but you know, mere matter and energy. It's nothing but matter and energy. God has nothing to do with it. And that would be a wrong interpretation of the what of the created world. We could also misinterpret the nature of this, the Holy Scriptures, and say this is merely a human work, a collection of myths that's inspired in the same way that a great artist is inspired. We would be misinterpreting the nature of this. But even if we get the nature of the Bible right and understand it to be the inspired infallible word of God, we can misinterpret what's taught in it. Think about any Christian bookstore. How many Christian theologians have you heard of in your lifetime that have taught false doctrines that are starting from a study of Scripture? Almost every other week at my apartment, we have Jehovah's Witnesses coming around. They have that Bible in their hands, but they're teaching a false doctrine from it. Same thing with nature. People are coming to nature and God's created works with wrong presuppositions, and so you end up with false theories of what's taught in there. And if you work your way back from that, you end up with a false theory of God because the creation reflects the, the nature of the one who created it. And so this is why when philosophers and scientists are coming up with these bizarre interpretations of scripture, they almost inevitably end up with a strange doctrine of God. Pantheism or panentheism, polytheism, you name it. We get all of these weird doctrines of God based on wrong ways of understanding God's created works. And with unbelievers, it happens all the time. There's an early Reformed scholastic theologian named Franciscus Junius, and you don't need to remember this, there's no final exam here, but he makes a distinction between true and false theology. And false theology is essentially what unbelievers do when they come to, to the created works with unaided reason, unaided fallen reason, where do they always end up in? It's false theology idolatry. They end up with the ancient Egyptian polytheistic religions, the polytheistic Canaanite religions, the Greek religions, the Roman mythologies, Norse mythologies, Aztec mythologies. All these false doctrines of God are what unbelievers do when they encounter creation. Now, is the fault God and his revelation through creation? No, it's because they're approaching this uh, as unbelievers. And they are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and exchanging the glory of God for a lie, for an idol. And the idols vary, but they all suppress the truth in this. And those who are teaching false doctrine are misinterpreting the other side of this. So when you see a so-called conflict, an alleged conflict between some scientific theory and some interpretation of scripture, the conflict is never up here. It's never with God. It's never with how he reveals himself. It's always in our human interpretations, our fallible human sinful interpretations, making a mistake about either what creation is or what we can learn about God from it or making a mistake about what scripture teaches and what it says about God, because it's not just, it's not just scientists and philosoph pagan philosophers who come up with these bad ideas. You get Arians and Tritheists and all kinds of heresies throughout the history of the church with people who, are, who believe this is the word of God and who are still coming to wrong conclusions about what God has said about himself. Now, there are also those who will argue that God has revealed himself in creation but this is, un, this is completely useless for unbelievers. They can't know anything about it. They can't have any knowledge of it, and they can't get any knowledge from it. And I think this, again, is something that's diverted a little bit from not only the early and medieval church, but from the first two centuries of Reformed theology. And I think, again, part of the problem here goes back to some developments that we see arising in the centuries preceding the Reformation, during the Reformation, re the Renaissance and Reformation, and then following it in the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment. You have uh, this, these ideas about whether we can know the external world, anything about it, whether our whether what we can know is true, whether the world exists or not, or whether everything's just in the mind. There's all kinds of strange philosophies going on. If you go back to the Renaissance, you have the rise of skepticism. I mean, many of you have studied the Renaissance and you know one of the major key phrases there was ad fontes, back to the sources. They were digging up all these ancient Roman and Greek sources and one of the things they dug up that should have remained buried 
was the writings of these ancient skeptics. These people who, uh, back in the, these Greek philosophers who deny, they either were hardcore skeptics or somewhat agnostic skeptics. They either said it's absolutely impossible to know anything true about the external world, or they said we can't know for sure that we can know anything true. They're just more agnostic about it. Um, Augustine was one of the ones who addressed this skepticism in the early church in his writings. And he had, if you put his books on a, the collected translations of the works of Augustine on a bookshelf, it fills up an enormous amount of space. And several of those volumes are addressed towards refuting skepticism. And one of the things Augustine and those following Augustine would point out is the absurdity of saying, it's ab I know, ab I'm absolutely certain that I cannot know anything absolutely about anything. It's just you have all these internal self-contradictions with skepticism, whether of the dogmatic or the agnostic kind. But with the, with the rediscovery of the skeptics in the Renaissance and Reformation era, that philosophy started to gain ground again. You know, th during that time, a lot of things were in upheaval. There's cultural upheaval, there's political upheaval, there's rejection of, you know, the church, there's upheaval in the church, there's upheaval in philosophy, and people are starting to wonder, can we know anything for sure? You know, everything's in, everything's in flux, everything's in chaos. What can I know for sure? And they started to doubt in the philosophers that adopted this and we just can't know. And they started to advocate a skeptical worldview. And just as in the early church, Augustine responded. So at this time, people attempted to respond to skepticism. Yet that was one of Descartes' major, major motivations, for example. He wanted to find some solid ground on which you could establish some certainty. Everything can't remain in doubt. Now Descartes used a methodology that's basically doubt in order to try to arrive at this place of certainty. And for him, it was the, the cogito, I think, therefore I am. I, in order for there to be doubt, there has to be a me, an I, who's doubting. That's where he started. He tries to deduce rationally from that point everything, including the existence of God and the existence of the external world. But he's trying to refute skepticism. And this, I'm not going to do a history of philosophy. There's others better qualified for this, and it would take all afternoon, just as reading all 150 Psalms would. But in a nutshell, what I would say is what has happened is if you look at the history of the doctrine of philosophy and parallel that with a study of the history of the doctrine of God in Christian churches who adopted Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment philosophies, the doctrine of God always follows certain views of what we call metaphysics or epistemology, the nature of being, the nature of our knowledge of being. As as Descartes moves in this direction, you have Christians who follow Descartes, Cartesians. You have the rationalists and the empiricists and the Kantians and the post-Kantians and the German idealists and so forth all the way up to today with the insanity of certain versions of post-modernism. And as these various philosophies take hold, you always have Christian theologians who want to be considered cool. <laughs> you, you remember when you're in high school and you were sitting at, this is, I'm speaking personally, I'm sitting at the Dungeons and Dragons nerd table and I want to be one of the cool kids. Christians have a way of doing this as well. And whatever the popular philosophy of the day is, there are Christians who will try to reframe Christian theology and the doctrine of God in light of that. Is Descartes the popular guy? Well, let, we need to reframe our theology in light of Descartes. Is it Kant? Well, now we have Kantian doctrines of God or Hegelian doctrines of God and so forth. And the same thing is going on today. When you have people who deny, for example, either the existence of the external world or the possibility of knowing it. You know, it may exist, but I can't know anything true about it. All I can know is the phenomenal world of sensory experience. That will change what you can do with general revelation and what your thoughts are about natural theology. If you go back to the earlier church, as Dr. Nichols was saying earlier when he cited Aquinas, what was Aquinas's argument? The, the one that Nichols phrased was we reason from effect to cause. We look at the created world, these created effects, things that are created by God, and reason from effect to cause. And what happens if you can't know the external world truly? Then you can't know the created effects truly, and you lose that whole way of thinking about and reasoning about God. And that's why that entire way of thinking has been put on the back burner or thrown in the garbage in the centuries since. But what I would say is this is something that 
that has caused problems with our doctrine, and we can't refute skepticism by adopting skeptical premises. Ultimately, that's going to be self-defeating. Even the, the philosophers who are trying to refute skepticism often adopted premises that were the, in themselves skeptical, and when theologians buy into that, it causes problems in our doctrine of God, and it's why there's so much chaos. Read the history of liberal theology, and it's a history of theologians hitching their wagons to one Enlightenment or post-Enlightenment philosophy after another. And when the evangelicals do that, the effects will end up being the same with their doctrine of God. Thankfully, most... Um, evangelicals and conservatives have confessional boundaries that keep them in line, but there can be a tension there, and sometimes that tension ends up resulting in evangelicals espousing things like open theism or something like that, denying that God is omniscient regarding the future. That's When you deny something like that, it's grounded in a particular way of, of viewing being and knowledge and so forth. So uh, this is sort of a... <laughs> A sideways saying, the study of philosophy is important for the study of theology. Um, one of my well, pet, pet rock doctrines, so I'm not going to go on a sidelong 20-minute rant about that, but I think it's helpful to know this. Just as a side note, Dr. Sproul once told me, he told me more than once, he said, one of the things that's so hard about teaching the doctrine of God is that it requires so much background in philosophy to really follow the, the errors and the heresies that are going on and to be able to see beneath the surface why they're saying these kind of things about God. But uh, it's possible for even for conservative evangelicals to fall into these kind of traps and uncritically buy into philosophies that are antithetical to truth. You just, you can't, deny the knowability of the external world and not have it cause some problems or deny that we have any possibility of knowing it because of our senses. Take, for example, the, the, those who deny that the general reliability of our senses, and they say we, we cannot be empiricist in any way, shape, or form because of our, our sensory faculties are completely unreliable. All we can depend on is scripture. You have to go to scripture. So I, the external world outside my mind is really unknowable. You just have to depend on scripture. Those of you who've listened to RC over the years will recognize this. What is this? Is the Bible. Where is the Bible? Is it an inner, is it a mental reality or an extra mental reality? Is it part of the external world? Part of the external world. What do I have to use to read this? Or what do you have to use to hear me reading this? our sensory faculties that God gave us. I have to use my eyes to read this, or if you're blind, you use your fingers to read it in Braille. If I'm reading it to you, you have to use your ears to hear it. Then you have to use your rational faculties to think about what I said and to understand it and either use your will to reject it or accept it, to believe it or not. So denying these kind of things has ripple effects, not only on our doctrine of God, but even on the very possibility of reading and getting revelation from God. Uh, those of you who've read some contemporary Reformed philosophy or theologians will know that there are people who have ways of getting around that. They'll uh, you know, say that the reading the scripture is the, just the occasion for God to implant that revelation directly into our mind, but the scriptures is just white paper with a bunch of black squiggly marks on it. It's not the means that God is using directly for this. We'll set that aside for now. I'm just going to go back to the traditional early medieval Reformation idea that there is an external world and we can know it, and thus we can understand general revelation, Romans 1, and there are certain ways of understanding natural theology that aren't pagan. When unbelievers use general revelation, remember, it always leads to pagan idolatry. Believers, as Paul says, we can look at this and we can see it and understand that the scripture, the created world does reveal the existence and the invisible attributes of God, including his glory and power. Now, assuming, assuming everybody here grants the ability to read and understand scripture, if you do that, then you cannot reject general revelation. Why? Because the Bible itself, special revelation, affirms the existence of general revelation. We looked at that in the first two sessions. Romans 1 teaches that, and I believe Dr. Moeller will be addressing this again. What can be known about God is plain to them, Romans 1.19, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived 
ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. That's not, there's a lot of discussion about that, but the basic point Paul's making is not particularly difficult to follow. In God's created works, he has revealed himself and it's knowable. Now we also know what sinners do with that, but he says, Paul says, they knew God. Now he'll also say elsewhere, they suppress that knowledge and that truth and unrighteousness, but they know God. We're in the, you cannot open your eyes, as Calvin says, and look outside at the, the lake and the trees and the grass and the skies above and not see the revelation of God. We can't even open our eyes and become conscious without recognizing the existence of God and the fact that we're created in the image of God. So if he's revealed himself in creation and if scripture says this, we can look at creation itself to see how and in what ways he's revealed himself. And we can also look at scripture to learn more about what we can learn and what we should learn from creation. And this brings us finally to the Psalms. And again, I I wish we could read through all of them and discuss this Psalm by Psalm, but that would take too long. But the Psalms, when, when you read theology texts on general revelation, there are two major texts that are usually cited. Romans 1 and Psalm 19 are two key proof texts for revelation. Romans 1 tells us very explicitly about the existence of general revelation. Psalms is, tells us the exact same thing Paul says, but it does so in poetic and metaphorical language very beautifully. Now, before we look at Psalm 19, I want to think about with you about the Psalms in general, and I want to look first at some general teachings in the Psalms considered broadly, and then take a step back and ask not only what do the Psalms teach explicitly that's relevant and instructive for our doctrine of general revelation, but what do the Psalms assume that is relevant to our doctrine of general revelation? What's there by, you know, what can we discern by good and necessary consequence from the scriptures using Westminster language there? So what is taught by the Psalms in general and what's assumed by the Psalms that is informative for our our understanding of general revelation. So let's look first at some of the basic teachings. Number one, and unsurprisingly, the Psalms teach that the Lord God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is not God. God created, he spoke into existence everything that is not God. God alone is necessary, eternal. The created world is contingent and exists because he spoke it into being. Psalm 33, verses 6 to 9, for example. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. This is echoing quite clearly Genesis 1. And God said, and it was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then throughout the creation narrative, and God said, and it was. He spoke all of creation, including us, into existence. This the entire creation. Psalm 136, verses 3 to 9. You remember this psalm. It goes back and forth. It has this common refrain throughout it. After every phrase, we read, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's almost this call and response, kind of back and forth hymn that's going on in the psalm. The, I, I can picture in my mind the one part of the choir singing this part, and then the other does the continual refrain. In between the refrains, however, in verses three to nine, I'm not going to read that refrain, that repeated refrain, but give thanks to the Lord of Lords, to him who alone does, does great wonders, to him who by understanding made the heavens, to him who spread out the earth above the waters, to him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, the moon and stars to rule over the night for his steadfast love endures forever. This shouldn't be a surprise. The Psalms teach that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But because of that, the Lord manifests his own glory in all of creation. His created works manifest the nature of the creator, not in in any kind of pantheistic sense, but they reflect who he is. They reflect his glory and power and wisdom and reveal his glory and power and, and wisdom and beauty and so forth. The Lord himself manifests this in many ways. If you read Psalm 29, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's, it's very frequent throughout the Psalms, this idea of the Lord's 
using creation as a way to manifest his glory in the waters and in the beasts of the earth and the beasts of the sea. He manifests his glory in all of these different ways. And so in summary, you'll run across numerous Psalms saying that the heavens declare his righteousness or some other aspect of creation declares his righteousness. Psalm 50, verse 6, for example, the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Psalm 97, 6, the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. And throughout the Psalms, we even hear the psalmist calling upon creation to declare the glory of the Lord. Psalm 89, 5, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Or Psalm 96, 11 and 12, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it, let the field exult and everything in it. Psalm 148, 3 and 4, basically calls upon every aspect of creation to praise the Lord. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, down to the insects. The psalmist is calling on creation to praise God. These are his created works, and he's calling upon them to do what they actually do by nature of being created. And then we have calls in the psalms for us as believers to meditate on the works of God's hand, to consider them, and to see what they reveal about God. Psalm 145, 3 and Psalm 143, verse 5, for example, I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. So these are just some highlights. We could go through the Psalms all day long and look at highlights of things it teaches about God and his creation and the way God reveals himself through his creation. But a second aspect, I think most of that's fairly obvious to us. What I think sometimes is lost are some of the general assumptions that are taught through the Psalms. The Psalms, like all of Scripture, assume certain things that are required even in order for us to read them and to understand them. They require, for example, the scriptures like, I mean, the Psalms, like all the scriptures, require and assume that the reader or hearer already has human faculties necessary to understand what it's proclaiming. The sensory faculties, for example, I just mentioned that they are required in order for us to read or to hear the word. We're, our, we use our eyes, our God-given sense of sight to read scripture, or our God-given sense of hearing to hear the word preached. Then uh, we have our rational faculties, intellect and our will. You have to use your intellect to understand what you're reading and what you're hear or what you're hearing read from Scripture, and you have to use your will in order to either ex believe it or not believe it. Now we know that the will is in bondage to sin. Fallen man's will is in bondage, and God has to give us new life and free that will in order to believe. And thus, faith is a gift of God, but it's still a, it's an exercise of our will. He doesn't will for us. We're not marionettes or puppets. So He has to liberate our will in order that we might believe. And that faith is a gift. He fixes our faculties. And again, our faculties are not perfect. They're fallible. My sight is imperfect. You know, I, I have to use these glasses. Many of you have glasses. But just because we're using glasses doesn't mean we're totally blind. I can't see a thing clearly from about here to here. I can see things beyond that better than 2020. I could probably read your Bible easier than I can read mine right here, even if it's 20 feet away. Um, not really, but I know that's a little bit of a hyperbole, but that's how bad my eyesight from here to here is. So we have to use our sensory faculties and our rational faculties in order to understand the Psalms. And then there's another point that I think that's often overlooked, that the Psalms, like all of Scripture, assume that we, the readers and hearers of the Psalms and the scriptures, already have some kind of knowledge gained apart from scripture required in order to understand scripture. And I only bring this up because I keep running across Reformed brothers denying this kind of thing. There are certain camps within the Reformed world that will say that the only things we can know using knowledge technically is what's in the Bible. You can't know anything that's not revealed in the Bible. That causes me a problem because I know that I'm a male 
And yet scripture doesn't say anything about me. My name's not in there. I also know my birth date. It's not revealed in there. Um, Or at least I know it because I believe the testimony of my parents. But on a broader scale, think about the things that you have to already know in order to read and understand scripture. You have to have a knowledge of the human language, for example, in which it's spoken to you or in which you read it. If, if I'm up here speaking and reading the scripture in Mandarin and Chinese or some language you don't understand, there's no way for you to get the content of that message. You have to already have this human language. And the scripture is not a book that provides grammar and syntax of English or German or Dutch or Mandarin Chinese or any other language. It was revealed in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and assuming that the hearers of it already had that knowledge of those language. It also assumes that you, the reader and the hearer, and I, the reader and the hearer, have a knowledge of the words and concepts it's using. That, uh, I mean, you go in the Psalms, for example, the Psalms speak of mountains, valleys, the sun, the moon, the clouds, the sea, rivers, trees, rocks, all kinds of things, assuming that the reader knows what those things are. When you find the word of God using these metaphors and similes that compare one thing to another, for for example, God is like a rock or a believer is like a tree. You don't have any idea what that's talking about if you don't know what a rock or a tree is already. So it's assuming certain things like that 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 are required. The psalmist says in Psalm 1-3 that the righteous man is, quote, like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Nothing will be communicated to you as the hearer or reader of that if you don't already know what a tree is, what streams are, what water is, what harvest seasons are, what fruit is, what leaves are, and what a withering is. You, I, you could just call out any verse. I could thumb through the Bible here uh, and have you yell stop at any point, just randomly put my finger on any passage in that scripture, and it assumes something that we know before that. Now, obviously, there's a difference because all of our knowledge is fallible and and Scripture is the inspired Word of God. That's not the point I'm making, but Scripture, God is using already existing human languages and words to communicate to his people. So we need to, again, beware of buying into metaphysics and epistemologies that sound very pious but aren't themselves taught or assumed in the Scriptures that that is our standard. You, you just, you're not going to understand scripture when it uses these metaphors if you don't understand these concepts and words. So all of this is to say that the Psalms assume, as all of scripture does, that human beings, even after the fall, have the capacity to know some truth about the created world. Go to Jesus in the Gospels. We step out of the Psalms for a minute. Jesus is talking to unbelievers and say, you yourselves can look at the clouds and see what's about to happen. There's a storm coming assuming they have some ability to know something about the created world by looking at the clouds in the sky. Proverbs is always doing this. You know, go to the ant. <laughs> look, at, you know, look at the created world. You can, you can know something about this. So this finally brings us to Psalm 19. After all of that roundabout general idea, let's just spend a few minutes. I don't think we, you know, we can't and don't need to spend a huge amount of time, but I want to look at how Psalm 19 teaches the same thing that Paul does in Romans 1. And we're just going to look at the first four verses, which read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. I would argue this again is saying exactly what Paul says, only doing so using poet using poetry rather than straightforward prose. He's using metaphors and figures of speech. I would also, before we look at these individual verses, I would like to point out that even though verses 1 to 4 are focused on general revelation, the psalm as a whole focuses on both. 1 to 4 looking at the created works and verses 7 to 11 focusing on the law of the Lord. Again, just reminding us that God reveals himself in both of these ways and they're not inconsistent or in any kind of real conflict. So verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens declare. Do heavens have a mouth and vocal cords? Obviously not. So Paul is using a figure of speech. He's using personification. He's anthropomorphizing the heavens and putting them, having them do something that only human beings can do. They can declare. They can proclaim. 
And they're personified as proclaiming the very glory of God. They declare God's glory and his, they declare his handiwork. Why? Because of what we talked about earlier in the Psalms, because God himself created the heavens and the earth. It's for that reason that his created works declare his glory. Any created works declare something about their creator. If you listen to a symphony by Johann Sebastian Bach, for example, it will tell you something about Johann Sebastian Bach, even if you never met the man. If you look at a painting by Rembrandt or a statue by, uh, just lost the name, great sculptor. If you look at a statue by any great sculptor, it will tell you something about that sculptor's genius, about his nature and his gifts and so forth. And if you Go out into the deserts of West Texas in the 2 a.m. on a clear night and look up at the skies. It will tell you something about the glory of God. I say the desert because it's clearer in the desert. You can see more of the stars. But when the sun comes up, if you look at the desert, it will declare something about the glory of God. If you stoop down and pick up a single grain of sand, it will declare something about the glory of God. If you go out there and look at any blade of grass or the ants crawling around between the blades of grass or those beautiful majestic oak trees, they all declare the glory of God. Any leaf on that oak tree declares something about the glory of God. So this is something that we can focus on from this passage. Verse 2, day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. That language, day to day and night to night, just points out the constancy. Paul says ever since the creation of the world, this declaration has been going on. The psalmist, day to day and night to night, it never ceases to glorify God, to declare and proclaim his glory. The heavens never cease this activity. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard, verse 3. There's no excuse. Same point Paul makes in Romans 1. There is no excuse. It's constantly being declared. And the reason we don't get it is because we're standing here with our hands over our our fingers in our ears like a two-year-old who doesn't want to listen to his mother. We're suppressing what's there and what is clearly revealed by God, suppressing it in sin and in unrighteousness and consciously and willfully replacing the glory of God with idols. Verses four, the vo- their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Not only is there no excuse, there's no excuse anywhere. General revelation is universal. Every human being has access to this. The voice of God in his general revelation is universal. Those who see this should acknowledge him as creator, but they don't. They suppress this. And that's where the necessity of special revelation will come into play. So, What I would like to conclude with, a few basic points. Number one, follow what the psalmist says. Consider and meditate on the works of God's hands. There's nothing wrong with studying nature. It's God's created works. It's the works of his hands. So science is a noble calling. Just don't do it assuming that God doesn't exist. That's what gets people into trouble. But look at everything, from every blade of grass to every star in the sky is the beautiful works of God's hands that glorifies him. Look through the telescope and through the microscope. Everything he did declares his power and glory in existence. But don't forget that general revelation, in the words of the Westminster Confession, is not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. You cannot look through a microscope or a telescope and see the gospel. We cannot see the gospel in the stars or in the blades of grass. The gospel is something that requires special revelation and something God did give to us in special revelation. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only in scripture, not in creation, only in scripture is revealed the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The son of God who became incarnate, who was born of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit and who for us and for our salvation he suffered and died on the cross, was crucified on the cross was for our sins, who paid an atonement for our sins, who redeemed us, who was raised from the dead three days later and is ex- ascended into heaven, is exalted at the right hand of the Father, and who has poured out the Holy Spirit and who now calls us out of the kingdom of darkness and out of all these false worldviews into the kingdom of, his be- of the beloved Son. And as sons and daughters of God in Christ who can cry out with Christ, Abba, Father, who has provided a means by which we can approach the throne of grace. That's revealed in special revelation, and that is good news and glorious news for which we will forever praise God and thank God. Thank you for...